Welcome back to the Urology Care Podcast. I'm going to let my guest today introduce himself. Hi, this is uh, Dr. Tim Average. I'm a urologist that specializes in kidney stones out of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, uh, and I'm here to chat about kidney stones today. Give us the background on how kidneys and the, the urinary system should function properly. So kidney is really one of the body's ways to filter things out that you no longer need. It uh, works by turning things over in your blood into urine. And when it creates that urine, uh, sometimes there are things in there that should, maybe shouldn't be or maybe are in too high of a concentration that could eventually turn into a kidney stone. What exactly are kidney stones in the first place? All right, so kidney stones are, well, like kind of a rock you might find in your garden, sure, but they're actually uh, various metabolites. The majority of them are calcium-based, uh, where they're basically rock-like structures that are uh, put together and form a solid mass that can be as tiny as a little dot or they can grow to a couple inches in length. Sure. And what exactly are metabolites and what are like some examples of other metabolites other than say a kidney stone? Sure. So the word metabolite really kind of means all the elements that are, uh, as I'm using it here, in in urine. Mm -hmm. So um, calcium, oxalate, um, uric acid, these are all byproducts, um, you know, side effects of how your body processes and, and works through what you eat and drink, uh, how your uh, body breaks down products and gets rid of things. So it's kind of like a little bit of the, the garbage system, if you will, getting yeah. the things that your body doesn't need. Sure. Um, so those metabolites, as I refer to them, are, are just those little components within the urine. Is it safe to say a kidney stone would be a buildup of those metabolites? Um, in a way, yes, okay. um, or at least a congregation of them. And what are kidney stones made of? Well, most people have kidney stones made from calcium, Mm -hmm. um, uh, but usually they're a mix of various things, Um, calcium being the most common. uh, There can also be kidney stones that are formed from uh, other elements, uh, some other ones uh, that are a little more rare, such as uric acid or cysteine. What are the most common kidney stones made of? Uh, The most common, as I I might have mentioned, are the calcium-based stones. It's about... Uh, 60, 70% of patients will have a calcium type stone. Nice thing about those is those mm-hmm. show up pretty well on x-rays. Uh, they're pretty common. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, someone is taking too much calcium in, but that yeah. is just the most common type form. There are lots of different reasons why folks get kidney stones. Sometimes it's, it's just your genetics and it's handed down from a family member, but other times it's diet and activity, type of foods that you eat, maybe too much of certain things. Um, all those things rolled together can contribute to, to kidney stone forming. And what are some signs of them? What would be a symptom of a kidney stone? So the most common thing a patient might have if they're having a kidney stone is when the kidney stone is starting to move and causes a blockage somewhere in the system. Um, if it's blocking the natural flow of, of urine that's coming from the kidney, then that triggers the pain sensation. So patients will have pain in their side. We call it flank pain. Uh, the pain may go down towards the groin. Um, it's usually pretty disruptive. It's pretty serious, um, but it also comes and goes. So we call it colic, uh, like a baby's cry. It comes and then goes away and then comes back and goes away. Sure. Patients, if they're really suffering, can also have some nausea and vomiting. Uh, they can also have some changes to their uh, way they, they pass their urine, they pee. Um, they can also see some blood in the urine. It's also possible. Should you know what type of stone you're getting? Will that help you in any way prevent maybe future stones? It, to, to the average urologist, it's pretty important to know the stone type. Uh-huh. Um, that's more for a decision on any kind of treatment you might want to start, uh, both uh, surgical treatment or maybe afterwards medical treatment to prevent the stones from forming. But that's only one piece of the puzzle mm-hmm. in that mystery. What are some other pieces of that puzzle? Yeah. puzzle? And you're going to ask. So uh, it's also important, uh, we find, to analyze a patient's urine uh, after the event, of course, um, to take a look and see what those metabolites are I mentioned earlier mm-hmm. that are in high levels in the urine and then maybe address them. So, for instance, we might find that there's a high level of oxalates in the urine. Oxalates is, uh, again, another byproduct of metabolism. And the average American diet, we tend to eat and drink a lot of oxalates. Uh, it's in coffee, tea, chocolate, peanut butter, and other nuts, green leafy vegetables. It doesn't mean we re- we ever recommend don't ever have any of those mm-hmm. things. It just means moderation. And is there any more diet tips you might have for people looking to prevent kidney stones? So certainly I recommend that if, if you have frequent kidney stones that you should be seeing a urologist for further information but and further advice. But in general, we talk about uh, increasing the amount of fluids that you take in 
water and lemonade are going to be the two best things. Mm -hmm. um, and we like most patients to produce about oh, two liters of urine a day, which is about uh, not quite a gallon, but we do like the urine to stay dilute because that's one way to help prevent stones from forming. Um, other things we give general recommendations is to lower the salt intake in one's diet. So try not to add uh, table salt, try not to eat foods that are uh, too many foods that are preserved. Mm -hmm. um, also try and limit the oxalates, as I mentioned before. Another, another place in the American diet where there's a lot of room for improvement is uh, the amount of animal proteins we typically okay. eat. That can actually shift the urine to have extra calcium in it. So in some patients, we generally say don't have those double, triple cheeseburger, yeah. but you know, perhaps just have a, a smaller helping of uh, meat. And does climate or the temperature play any role? Maybe in the summer months, are they more likely to form? We, we definitely see a rise in patients presenting with kidney stones in the summer and hot months. Mm -hmm. um, there's even a, what's commonly referred to as a stone belt in the United States. Uh, the southern uh, portion of the United States tends to have more stones th than others. Yes, it could be related to genetics and lifestyle that may be similar in those same areas. But we do think that uh, dehydration plays a big role in this process. Is there any other lifestyle habits besides diet that you can think of that might affect a kidney stone risk? So the, the prevention strategies usually are all around uh, diet and uh, fluid intake. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some instances where medicines are actually helpful as well. Okay. Um, beyond that, uh, just uh, the, the common ones I, I just mentioned. Yeah. And are people at more risk for forming stones again if they've already had them in the first place? Yeah, great question. So the average patient, if you have one stone, you're fairly likely about one in uh, two chance that you'll have another stone in five to 10 years. Um, so it's definitely something to be aware of. If you've already had a couple stones, then that risk is even higher. Is it important to, if you are a a recurrent stone former, is it important to maybe keep a food diary or anything like that so you can communicate to your healthcare provider what you're eating? So you, usually in most of the workup in a urologist's office for a patient with uh, recurrent stones will not only include what I mentioned earlier with um, uh, gathering the stone analysis, gathering urine information and urine metabolites, but it would also be understanding what a patient takes in every day. It's not always easy to remember what you had for breakfast yesterday, so uh, we usually have patients write it down, and that way we can confer with them and, and hopefully help uh, modify the diet. Now, you mentioned the medications. Is there anything you wanted to touch on about that that might be helpful in preventing stones? Uh, just to stress that, that there are certain stone types where medications are very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, usually that should only be started after a workup has been uh, performed, sure. but they can significantly help reduce stones from coming back. There seems to be a lot of fear associated with passing a kidney stone related maybe to the pain that's involved. Is there any advice you can give to people who are fearful? Sure. Well, it's certainly uh, understandable that one can be apprehensive or scared about an upcoming uh, painful episode. And, mm -hmm. and certainly if one is at home and starts to experience some, some flank pain, you can certainly try a non-steroidal like Advil or Motrin type okay. medicine as a starting point. If it works, great. Obviously, if it's not working, then uh, seeking uh, medical care is important. Uh, medications uh, such as um, narcotics or uh, stronger uh, anti-inflammatories that have been given by vein can mm -hmm. be very helpful. And then there are some other medications that we give patients uh, who are chronically passing sure. stones uh, that can help them through those episodes because there are medicines that can help a stone pass uh, quicker. Any other final advice you'd like to give to patients on preventing stones or dealing with stones before we wrap up here? Sure. I think hopefully one of my take-home messages is that uh, you know kidney stone disease is a uh, potential problem for the future uh, in, in someone who has a stone. And as we were discussing earlier, seeing a urologist in follow-up and, and making sure that uh, you're screened for further stones down the line uh, so that there aren't many surprises. Um, and then working towards prevention are, are really some of the strongest things someone can do to, to prevent further stones. I want to thank my guest today, Dr. Average, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. If you'd like to learn more about kidney stones, visit urologyhealth.org slash kidney stones. This podcast has been brought to you by the Urology Care Foundation, the official foundation of the American Neurological Association.